Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Fitness Philadelphia. I'm Dr. John Herding, and today we have a very special guest and longtime friend, Dr. Aaron Farmer. Hi, Aaron. How are you? Hello, John Herding. I'm good. I'm so excited for today because we, I feel like we connect like once a quarter. It's not we enough. Yeah. It's usually when I'm hurt. <laughs> Um, and, and, or I'm like, Hmm, I'm making a big life change. Let me go talk to John Herding about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have to make that more often, number one, but number two, you're just someone that I've just respected throughout our time knowing each other because we, we connected kind of at another chapter of your life when, um, and we'll get into this as we get into the podcast, you were a gym owner and I was a PT looking to connect with like-minded individuals for referrals where we could work together for, you know, clients. Um, but it's been really interesting to see your path as you've, you've continued to kind of have this, you know, zest and zeal for learning and progressing your knowledge and really helping people. Um, so I've admired, um, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but who cares? Because <laughs> you were one of the original, we were just talking before we got on original CrossFit gym owners in the city of Philadelphia. So you were a cultural icon in creating the <laughs> CrossFit culture in center city, of Philadelphia. <laughs> and, and now to see your path in the new chapters you've taken over the years, it's great. Um, but Aaron, tell me a little bit about your, your fitness path, how you, came to be a gym owner, what motivated you to do that? And now what motivated you to kind of take these next steps in your, you know, human movement, um, you know, like, I don't know, human movement progression so that, so how you came to be where you were, give us your bio. That's the easiest way to say it. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, basically, uh, <sighs> the quick and dirty on the bio is that I have pretty much always been an athlete. Um, weirdly, my main sport growing up was tennis. Um, and I went to like a D3 school, so nothing insane. Um, but I've always enjoyed movement and, um, and just generally being in like a team environment is something that I, um, it's just integral to who I am. And so uh, I actually kind of started out in the Philadelphia fitness community um, when I was a personal trainer, when I was on a med school track. And um, I actually learned a lot about my uh, just lifting in general, first from my friend Greg Pivatera, um, who opened uh, CrossFit Center City with me. Um, in like 2000, at the end of like 2008, I think. And um, we ran that together for a little while and it was supposed to be like my gap year from med school, um, which is funny now. Um, but anyway, so Greg eventually um, sold me part of the business and left to pursue his own stuff. And then it was just me. Um, and um, I never went back to med school, um, but I did own and operate um, CrossFit Center City for almost a decade. And prior to that, I also um, dabbled in ownership in South Jersey as well. So um, the story kind of like goes over the bridge a little bit too. But yeah, my, my roots are, uh, they go way back with like CrossFit.com main site, mm -hmm. um, when we first opened CrossFit Center City, it was literally with a um, thousand pounds of sand on a tile floor with like one barbell in a cage and four pull-up spots with like an mm -hmm. inch and a half thick bar that we got from Home Depot. So um, that was the beginning. And then um, throughout that decade-ish, um, CrossFit Center City changed a ton. I learned a lot. Um, we were one of the first, well, actually, I believe we were the first um, barbell club in the city as well. So um, actively doing strongman and actively doing Olympic weightlifting on a competitive scale nationally. Um, and 
yeah, it, it was a whole adventure. Um, and then I think kind of just the way I ended up where I am now, I am currently a physical therapist, um, like John, uh, I have always been a little more drawn to and interested in people who, um, either kind of felt like they're, uh, they weren't able to access fitness, um, either because of their background or because of just physically being injured. Um, and, and that kind of came out, like, even when I was programming, um, at a really high level, um, I just, I was always trying to fix people and, um, you know, there's some good things about that, but then some bad things about that with performance. But, um, I eventually sold the gym to my good friend, Wiley Velasic. And, um, and I did that in order to pursue my doctorate in physical therapy, um, which I got, uh, I started PT school with my three month old Elijah and then I ended and I took the boards at like 36 weeks pregnant with my second kid, Ari. And, um, yeah, so now I'm on the other end of that and I'm mm -hmm. practicing in center city and loving it and learning a lot. And I've just started treating pelvic floor and it's been just amazing to get here and have that all in my background. Well, it's funny that you mentioned, and this is how deep your roots go, that um, the Barbell Club, like we had Jim yeah. on. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So you start to look at like the tree of people that came out of the gym between like Jim and Wiley, and I'm sure you can name a bunch of others that have become like these great fitness influencers in the city too. So you're yeah. like the OG. <laughs> um, but, okay. <laughs> But it, what's funny too is I, I remember, I don't know if you know this, but my first job out of undergrad in 2006 was I was running the gym at Airmark Tower at what? Oh my gosh, no. Yeah. I didn't and know that. I remember we had the first ever time I got turned on to CrossFit was it was like a Philly firefighter who worked for Airmark. I don't, somehow, yeah. no, he, he worked for Airmark and he wanted to become a Philly firefighter. So he's like training for the test. And he was like the strong yeah. guy who could max out. Like the gym was small and it was machine based. Like it was on the 11th floor maybe. So you, there are no weights mm -hmm. to drop or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And he was maxing out the leg press machine. Like that's he couldn't very press Very special. That's a special person right there. So that's when I got turned on the main page of CrossFit. It was like, what are we okay. going to do to train this guy with like minimal, like <laughs> basically volume is what it was right yeah like oh, circuit yeah. based volume yeah um, or it was like just try this one thing for a little bit see if you can do it that was it and i was like brand new out of school i didn't know how to write a program and i would just go onto the main page pull a workout and just be like try this today <laughs> see you're an og um, too that is it not a, well it, so it's funny like but by the time by you know, there are no gyms in the area to, there are no CrossFit gyms in the area. Yeah. It was just CrossFit was just coming up in like 2006. It was just the yeah. old school WordPress main page. So it's Absolutely. amazing to see what it become. Oh my gosh. And yeah. then when people like you are taking the leap, you're like, what are they doing? Like, what is this CrossFit <laughs> stuff? Like, this is just the <laughs> fad that's going to fade away. And then you guys mm -hmm. ended up starting gyms and it became this huge fitness phenomenon. Yeah. And so you're on top of it. So lots of credit goes to you. Well, it was also, it was wild too, because it was like in the middle of a recession. So, um, like just, it was a, it was a funny time, like to be doing anything a little bit risky. And then on top of that, we were like asking these, you know, professionals in Philadelphia to like haul sandbags everywhere. And it was, it was just funny, but honestly, like anybody who is listening to this, that is, from that time and, and knows anybody from that time will tell you that the, the first, I mean, maybe this is true of most gyms, but the first like 10 to 20 members that you have are so incredibly special. Um, and I still, to this day, am just so floored by the level of influence that those members have had in my life. And, um, and even the ones that I'm not in touch with anymore, like I don't even think that they understand how life-changing it was for me to have them be the people that knew me when I was like 22 mm -hmm. <laughs> and figuring out how to do everything. So yeah, anyway, it was a really special time. 
Well, so tell me about, so you, it was in the original, the location that it's in now or different? No, locations? so that's a whole arc of the story too. But our original, so our original, original location was actually, I would literally drive around in my dad's pickup with like barbells out the back mm-hmm. of my truck, tires, sandbags. I'd bring everything with me and we would meet at the art museum, uh, like the base of the art museum steps. That was like yeah. where I would park it. And um, that was when we were first affiliated and we didn't even have a space. And then we got into our first space, which was at the Kamak Center, which is now like tragically been torn down. That place oh, no. was amazing, like in Philadelphia, like central to Philadelphia fitness in the neighborhood. And the only reason I found that space is because I became friends with um, Megan Ramos, who at the time worked at 12th Street Gym, which is how the Kamak Center was even a thing. So mm-hmm. the Mac Center was the little room with like, like, I don't even, it was, I mean, maybe we had, I don't, it was like not a lot of square feet, like just not a lot. And like I said, the tile floor, um, there used to be like another studio on the other side that like people would have to walk through our workouts to get to this other studio. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were there for a little bit and then we expanded and that was about the time that the business, um, like once we were into our second space on uh, 13th street, um, that was when uh, we transferred ownership. And then once, once we were there, we had the same problem that many urban affiliate owners have had, which is floor and sound and your landlord just hating you and all your neighbors hating you. And we eventually moved to 1229 Chestnut street, which is the space that the gym is in now. And yep. Wiley has done like an incredible job just making that look a lot better than it was when I was there. But, oh, yeah. it was fine. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was good. It was fine. It was okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so as you're a part of this, like, what was some, what was the biggest challenge you found as you're creating this fitness revolution and CrossFit community in the city? I'm not going to let you live that down. That you are this cultural <laughs> CrossFit icon. <laughs> You're, you're, you're really doing it. Okay. I'm blushing in case anybody can't tell. But, um, so I, I think that's a good question. I think honestly, some of the difficulty initially was it's still out there. I think it's maybe a little bit less, but the initial challenge was just that we were coming out at a time when the idea of like strength training for normal people was still very weird like it was still kind of crazy to say to someone like we're not gonna we're not gonna um just have you like run three miles you know and that'll be the thing that makes you fitter we were asking people to try hard (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) which it seems like is such a crazy idea but like in some ways, and I've had this conversation with those 20 members at some point, it worked as this like litmus test. Like if you were not willing to get a little dirty and like try hard, um, you just didn't end up joining the gym, you know? And, and that was fine. Like, you know, CrossFit is not for everybody, but, um, it meant that the members that we did get were people who were like, real salt of the earth, like, and also kind of salty, like people, you know, and it was great. Um, and so that was a big challenge at first. And I remember very clearly, like having the conversation specifically with women, like over and over and over again, like, no, you will not get bulky. If you do, this is probably what's happening, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so that initial bar was, was tough. And then I think like, eventually the the bigger difficulty we went through this phase where we were growing so quickly that it was just like how do we maintain the quality of what we're doing because one of the things that made us good i think originally was that we just we were not big fans of people paying for us to just like hit play on the music chuck a workout on the board and then just like check out, you know, like Mm -hmm. we wanted to be movement specialists and we wanted to be who be people who were prioritizing, um, 
the level of um, quality that I think early CrossFit, to be honest, was sort of known for, you know, like good, good coaching, you know? Um, and there were other challenges that arose, but honestly, like that whole uh, ebb and flow of wanting the quality without, you know, sacrificing the business itself um, was a big issue and, and it continues to be, I think still. Yeah. So what was the, can, if you don't mind, can we get into that? Um, the hurdle about talking to women about strength training discussion, because sure. I yeah. know that you're passionate about that a little bit, but like, <laughs> how did you get over that hurdle? Cause it's obviously it's become, it, it's great to see more women, you know, be receptive to strength training. But I also think there's still that stigma hanging on a little bit where women are afraid to oh, lift yeah. a heavy weight or, you know, go towards a barbell. But how did you deal with that conversation? And, and what's some advice you have for either like an up and coming coach or someone that's, that's scared to strength train? Like mm -hmm. I'm interested in that discussion. Yeah. Um, so I will say that one of the things that initially drew me personally to CrossFit was this idea of like empowered womanhood, um, which is, it sounds like really cheesy because it's just fitness. But um, I remember seeing, um, and maybe you'll know about this because you were around then too, but I remember seeing this video uh, of a workout called Nasty Girls, which involves, um, which involves women basically doing muscle ups in addition to like doing heavy cleans. Um, and I remember seeing that and just being like floored at um, just that that was even possible. Mm -hmm. And I literally, when I first started CrossFit, I thought I would just die. I would like look at workouts and I'd be like, surely I will die if I, if I do this. So the thing that happens is you do them and then you don't die. So then you're like, wow, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, early CrossFit was, was very much about empowerment of women. And, um, and so I think that one of like, when you asked me this question about like, how, how did I deal with that conversation? I think initially one of the biggest things was this idea of what do you think you will look like if you are a person who can like run a decent mile back squat your body weight a couple times and do a pull up. Mm -hmm. It's, it's hard to imagine someone being able to do all those things and not having this like physical idea of themselves that sort of matches what they would want to be looking like anyway. So mm -hmm. I think like initially that was something that drew people in, like really just championing your function and your capability over what you over this like idealized version of yourself that doesn't even actually exist right like i think that's the the rub with most women and their their and any kind of hang-ups we have with strength training is like we just we had this idea of being so loyal to this person that literally doesn't exist this person who we think should be like whatever idea you're going for hasn't ever happened yet. So, yeah. um, so I think that was a very big part of the beginning. Um, I will say now that especially, um, I mean, a lot has happened in the fitness community that has sort of shifted the way we think about what health is. And when people come to you with goals that involve fat loss, versus like maybe they aren't interested in fat loss, right? Um, yes. I think that whole um, conversation has really shifted a lot actually. Um, I still see people struggling with that. Um, I would like to think that even just the idea that CrossFit exists in this city in a real way has absolutely changed what women in the city, you know, expect of themselves and think they should be able to do, um, which is really like mind blowing to think about it that way. But I, I think it has changed the way that people um, walk into this idea of fitness for a purpose. Right. Um, mm -hmm. 
but yeah. So to answer your question about like now, what I would say, um, in many ways, I'd probably say the same thing, you know, like, what is it? I, I mean, I've talked with a couple other coaches about this too, but I think the why behind your goal is, is a really important one. So if, if fat loss is your goal, um, you know, why? <laughs> and, and that is hard. I think that's a hard conversation to have with people and it takes buy-in and it takes relationship. Um, but it's important because when you, when you start to work with a client, right, you, you want to understand those pieces behind it, right? Like maybe the reason that you feel like fat loss is so important is honestly, because you're having some trouble in your own personal life, <laughs> accepting mm -hmm. who you are and right. And having confidence in who you are just now, you know, without this like hyper idealized sense of yourself. Yeah. Um, and I, I've always been a big fan of, you know, like letting the work that we do in fitness change you as a person, um, which is really where I get into trouble a lot because <laughs> I always want to make things personal. Mm -hmm. um, and, but yeah, I don't know that if I have to die on that hill, I will. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. But I think that speaks to like your, your caring intuition and just wanting to like, I think there's always this psychosocial component of whether it's yeah. fitness or now that you're in the medical world, like, you know, when you're sitting down with somebody in your current situation, they've been dealing with pain for a while. Like there's absolutely oh, yeah. a psychosocial part. And I think many times you oh, have God, to get yeah. to that. Well, first of all, the person has to be open and talking about it, but it takes a right. skilled therapist to really get them, build the relationship, get them to open up. And especially yeah. in our chronic pain people, it's, okay, now this might, now we're finally starting to get to it. You're starting to open up yeah. a little bit and there's some psychosocial things that we need to address. And um, whether we have the skills to do it or your network, you, you have a referral that you can send them to. I think whether it's in your current situation dealing with pain or it's working into something more around fat loss or what's going on mm -hmm. at home or mm -hmm. building a community around fitness, which is something right. that you did. Mm -hmm. And that's what CrossFit's really kind of known for is the communities that they build. Right. I think yeah. it just speaks to the larger picture of as fitness professionals, we just need to be in tune with the, the psychosocial part of it and not neglect that because that's a huge realm of health. And it's probably yeah. even bigger than any physic physical benefits or any, any way that we're physically guiding any of our patients or clients or anything. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, to your point about like, I think it's, um, it sort of reminds me how uh, in PT school, mm. there were people who had a lot of trouble, like actually asking questions, for instance, about like depression and anxiety, like on a, on a screen. Right. Mm -hmm. But those, those aspects of who we are as people and what we struggle with are directly impacting everything, you know? And mm -hmm. so it's, it's been interesting to, to definitely be on the clinical side of things and feel a little bit empowered to say to people like, you know, I, just so you know, this is absolutely affecting your pain. We don't know to what extent, like I don't have a little microscope to go in and see your dopamine levels and whatever else, but it's, it's impacting what's going on. And, um, and yeah, I think I, I definitely miss that aspect of community building and gym ownership that, that really that's something that kind of is always happening in the background and like shout out to all those affiliate owners who are like kind of dealing with this all the time, right? Like you're always dealing with personalities and with the management of people's wellness, um, not just, you know, to the extent of how strong they are and how fit they are, but also just like how they're feeling about their lives. Um, yeah. I think that's a really big challenge, but also it's something that the best gyms do really, really well. You know, they, they provide an environment that is truly life-changing for people and not just for themselves, but it kind of, it does kind of bleed out into the community. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I get really excited about that stuff. It's no, well, I think like, <laughs> I, like you said, the best gyms are doing it. So I think for gyms that haven't quite found their way to, provide that it's a huge opportunity for them to improve their community 
And yeah. I think for, you know, the, the person looking for the right to fit for a gym, because we know like finding the, the fitness community that you want to be a part of is a huge part of staying consistent and seeing the progress yeah. that you want. Like, I think that's something that, you know, someone listening to this, looking for the right fitness space for themselves mm-hmm. to get a good workout. I think they need to look for those gyms that have built and fostered that community. They're mm-hmm. going to be supportive and be able to provide them with a safe space to, you know, be, be the respite from a hard day from whatever's going on at home or work or whatever, yes. you know? Yeah. Yeah. One of my, um, so one of my mentors is this amazing woman named Sharon Preet, who I know through, um, OPEX for anybody who's mm-hmm. familiar with that. That's like a coaching model. Um, but she has said to me before, remember that healing is sacred and in many ways, you know, that is what we're doing, obviously as PTs, you know, we're working on healing with people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would argue that coaching and gym environments are also doing that. Like you're healing a lot of things. Like, first of all, everyone's always sore all the time, but then also there's this aspect of like somebody coming in with this, like this goal, which is, which is usually on the tail of some kind of problem, you know, like people deciding like, like nobody comes into the gym without directly having a, a very big shift in their life that is that is sort of forced them to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I love this idea of kind of thinking about fitness spaces and medical spaces mm-hmm. as sacred, right? Like it's it's sacred space. Like, and it's one of the reasons why, like, like when everybody in a CrossFit gym is done with a workout and there's that one more person who's going, like. The best gyms are the places where everyone just kind of knows and nobody says anything, but you all just kind of wait and you watch and you let that person finish what they're doing, ideally without making it a big spectacle, but like cheering them on, right? In some way. Um, And that's that's really special because if you think about it, that's just, it's not something that happens in everyday life. And that's not, you're not going to find that in a box gym and you're not going to find that, you know. I mean, your kickball team is pretty cool. Probably not there either, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been very into that idea lately. And especially with starting treatment of pelvic floor, I also have kind of seen that come out a yeah, lot more. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been neat to, to start to think about my role in that. Yeah. And I think you said something very powerful there. Like when you really break it down and this is important for a gym owner listening uh, like it is usually life change that brings people into a gym, whether it's yeah. a personal life change or it's, you know, um, getting through, you know, like the doctor told them they need to make a change. They're going yeah. through a divorce. They're dealing yeah. with depression or they um, move to the, trying to like, stay sober. For the first time to a new town. Yeah. Or so, yeah, like, sober is a big one too. That also happens all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. So it's like these new, it's, it, it very often is, and I've never thought about it that way. It's very often these big life changes where someone's had like the come to that moment and it's like, okay, I need to make a change here. And they're mm-hmm. looking for someone to support them in a community to make that change. And if you can provide that, it can be huge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. But I think now with, it's uh, interesting now with your, you getting into the medical model and you're getting to into one of the most personal spaces. Like I'm sure you're seeing how (laughs) trauma and life change impacts the therapies that you're now providing with pelvic floor stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, we were talking about this before Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I was saying, you know, I would love to talk about pelvic floor because, um, it's something that I'm currently, um, just delving into. Um, but yes. So, That has become um, just really fascinating to me. I mean, for one thing, um, this whole idea of female empowerment, like definitely um, that is for me part of pelvic floor, right? Obviously that there are so many um, people who are just living with this level of pain, both male and female and in between, you know, um, who just think it's part of their life. They think like they should always have trouble with um, any kind of like urination or defecation. They should always have, you know, pain with sex or they should live with this history of sexual trauma and how it affects their life and their pain or back pain. You know, it just, there's so much of that that I feel like I've, I'm just kind of getting into, but 
I'm finding um, that it's a very, I, it is a sacred space. Like it absolutely is. I had pelvic floor therapy before becoming a pelvic floor therapist. And there is this level of vulnerability that I think doesn't exist in other kind of spheres. And it becomes um, just such an interesting privilege to be able to help people in this way. Um, some of my first patients were, it was crazy ends of the spectrum, like, cause I have people who are dealing with like urinary incontinence that are like in their seventies mm -hmm. and you're, you're literally getting to introduce them for the first time to this idea of their bodies, like, and how this works. Um, and I've had, I, my first like two pelvic floor patients left and they both said the same thing. They both went, that was so much fun. And I was shocked. Like I was like, oh, I didn't think that was the way this was going to end. But yeah. that's, that's what they both left saying. And I, you know, John, you know that I, I love learning and I love teaching. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's just such a pivotal part of pelvic floor therapy. And um, yeah, so like my 70 something year old patient and my patient who was dealing with, you know, dyspareunia, being with sex and, and having a history of that, like both leaving saying the same thing, like I'm, I'm just floored by um, what I could do as a clinician to help them, but also just like, it's an incredible privilege to be able to treat this kind of pain and, and these kind of issues. Yeah. I mean, it's just important to realize the the type of impact that we have on people and not, it, I see lots of medical professionals kind of taking for granted the impact that we have on people. And just, you know, I, I think that's that we need to bring ourselves back to center very often just to realize that we're really making a change in these people's lives that, um, you know, could open all kinds of doors and possibilities for them. And um, just you know, if I'd take it back to the clinically, I just think we all, we need to all take a step back and be like, okay, yeah. Like we, we need to bring our A game every day, no matter what we're dealing with. <laughs> and we need to have yeah. this support network around us to yeah. make sure that um, these people that are coming to us to find a safe space, again, medical community or in coaching that we're able to provide that safe space and community for them. Yeah. Well, and I think to be honest, you know, you're, you're a really, so like you get to build me up, I'll build you up, but you're a great example of, you know, just somebody from a clinical perspective that I have looked up to because I, you know, we've had a lot of conversations where we've talked about just different models of PT and, and really, um, when you go into PT ownership there, you, you have to make a conscious decision about, what you're going to do, you know, like, are you going to prioritize the patient? Um, or are you going to, you know, put four patients on a, you know, in a room with four tables with like two aids and like, just like shuffle people through, like it's, th those are really intentional decisions that get made. And when I have been a patient of yours, I, I always felt really, um, that you would have taken as much time as it as I needed to, to get to the bottom of a problem. Um, and that you were never going to tell me a lie, you know, like you were always going to like, give me the truth. Like, how long is this going to take? And, um, you know, what is your current issue and what do you know about this? And, um, that is, uh, I think those are really rare things. And that's how I originally met you anyways, because like, I mean, to, to be honest, I was referring people to other parts of Philly mm -hmm. for physical therapy and A, people were not getting better or B, like, you know, I, <laughs> I was like, well, this person has to snatch. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about that? And, no, <laughs> and none of these yeah. PTs even knew what I was talking about. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, I think it's a really special thing that you're currently doing in your practice. And obviously that's growing, but um, Thank you. Yeah. Well, but, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, but that speaks to why we're kind of, I feel like we're on the same, same wavelength where we want to make sure that we're providing a, a great, honest service to people because they're really entrusting us with their health. Yeah. Like, yeah. again, we're providing that safe space so that they can open up and we can look at them holistically to make sure we make the change that we need to, instead of just throwing them on a table with an, you know, an impersonal relationship where we give them off to an aide. Yeah. 
right? Yeah. That's, that's not creating lasting change. And you know, what's interesting about that is it also feels like, like when I've been out in the clinical world and seen this, um, I, it's like, so it makes the job of physical therapists, like so terrible to do it the other way. Do you know what I mean? Like you feel like you're crap at your job because people don't get better, first of all. And secondly, like, it's just rote, you know, it's, it's protocols and it's, it's not very fun. And I mean, and you end up feeling like, you know, you're a cog in a wheel in a big system. And so, yeah, that lack of creativity is really draining. Um, I think on the other side is kind of what you started to say, which is that if this is the level of personal investment that you're going to put into your job, you need to also be investing in your wellness, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that that is a whole other conversation. <laughs> uh, yeah, 100%. Uh, yeah, and a big, a big balancing act all the time um, for anybody that's doing that, right? Whether you're a coach or you're a PT or a business owner, period. Yeah. It's something you're always doing. Absolutely. So how do you think like you, you, you've the coaching to clinician transition and how that's helped you to craft the type of service that you're able to give? Like we, you know, we, we talked about it briefly before we got on, but how do you think um, the, the coaching and the reps you put in doing that has helped you to craft kind of how the type of clinician that you've come? Cause one of the things I tell most every student that comes through that wants to work in the same spaces that we are is you need to start coaching now. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. And they're yeah. like, well, how do I start doing that? Well, get a job as a personal trainer or start shadowing <laughs> coaches or, yeah. you know, you just need to start understanding people, understanding movement, how people mm -hmm. respond to certain cues. And um, how do you think your background of coaching has now influenced you as a PT? Um, and, I mean, just in every way possible. Um, so one of the most obvious is just uh, dosage, like uh, just this concept of like how much it takes to get someone to be better. Um, and um, also along those same lines, this idea that like any specific problem in your body is not just about that body part. And I think, you know, it's, everybody knows like everything is connected, you know, but really and truly like the, the further on I get into this, the more that I'm like, your ankle problem is not an ankle problem and your neck problem is not a neck problem, right? Um, there's certainly things that I'm gonna do that are very focused on your ankle and your neck if you come to me hurt in those places, but I'm never going to be a PT who's not going to try to like literally reform your body when you come to me with like one body part that's hurt. Um, and I think that's because when I've coached people, right, like I can see how those deficits uh, are directly impacted by, you know, just general dynamic balance issues or general weakness. Um, and, you know, maybe it's a little harsh to say it that way, but you know, most of the people who walk into a gym, like they're not training yet. They don't have, they don't know how to move their bodies and they aren't strong enough to be able to withstand, you know, the, the perils of like sitting at a desk all day. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So I think dosage and kind of that general concept of like seeing the body as a whole is something that, um, was very informed by coaching. Um, the life coaching piece is sort of like what we've already talked about. The whole biopsychosocial piece is really important. And I'll give you a, a just like a recent clinical story. So mm -hmm. if you are a clinician, you have definitely had um, those patients that, I mean, I'm just going to say they're like Medicare patients who are just like coming to you and they're like um, just really deconditioned and their motivation level is like zero. And they're just there because they're like, I know I want to feel better, but I literally have no idea how to do this. And um, I think a lot of clinicians see that person who you have to motivate as being like very frustrating um, and kind of like not worth it, you know, like to, to be really um, just blunt about it. Like that's a little bit the sense that I get. Mm -hmm. I 
I'm not saying I would want to treat them all the time. <laughs> I don't want to be in a sniff, but I do find that they're a really interesting challenge um, from the perspective of like being able to um, use my background in life coaching to co-create goals with these people to really say to them, like, look, like you did show up at the clinic, like, which takes a certain amount of wherewithal and planning. Like, so that tells me that somewhere like deeply buried inside of you, there is a person who wants to believe and hope for their own betterment. Right. So how can I bring that person out and how can I, um, how can I let this patient, um, more identify with that voice than all the other voices in their head. You know, the voices that say like, well, this will just be the same that it's always has been. So even down to like this patient that I have right now, I've, I've found out that she like is very motivated by visual um, markers. So mm -hmm. like when she comes in, I have a number for her every day of like how many sets we'll do. Right. And I yeah. like leave these post-it notes up on the window for her that she gets to physically pull off. And for her, I know it sounds like such like a childish thing, but for her, that is inherently so much more motivating than me being like three sets of 10 and like, go girl. Like that yeah. is so different to her. Um, I've also found that for instance, for her choices, like, and really just her being empowered to make those for herself are very important. So she will come in and like, we talk about how she's doing mentally for that day. And I will say, okay, do you want me to give you two options or you want me to tell you what, what I want you to do today? And that puts the ball in her court. So those are all things that I, I like, I cannot tell you that PT school has taught me. I, I only know those things from working with, um, co clients from forever. Um, your point about knowing how to cue people is a really big one. I have like the weirdest cues, like from just, I mean, literally like have been pulling them. Like you mentioned, Jim, I have cues from Jim. I have cues from like random CrossFit um, coaches. Like I have cues from seeing PTs I've seen in the past, mm -hmm. you know, like, and it's just um, at my PT school, Arcadia, we'll, we'll big bump for them. Um, there was a professor who talked about us developing our library of feels which is like when you feel a joint like knowing kind of and feel and, and knowing you know okay this is how i'm going to treat this based on what i feel yep. um the same goes for anybody who's looking to start now with coaching or teaching it's like a library of uh cues <laughs> you know just mm -hmm. how how can i have five different ways of saying the same thing because um that is huge for people. Um, so those are really long winded answer mm -hmm. and I could definitely go on, but those are probably some of the biggest contributing parts of my background as a coach that have really come into my time as a clinician. Yeah. And just speaking to going back to the beginning of that, like I know, and we've talked about this prior in the podcast, just like the con ed rabbit hole that you've gone down, you've opened a Pandora's box <laughs> and you're like, you, it's going to, you're going to get very frustrated very quickly, but it's great <laughs> because you just have this like zest for learning and it's going to only impact your patients, you know, positively and impact your own. You, you still continue to train. You talked about how you can still do a muscle up. I'm not going to say huh, only age, recently. But, I wasn't sure, <laughs> um, but it's still impressive. Right. And you know, that and, and dosing too, I think is huge because I think, PTs in general are just underdosing and underloading people. And I think you're yeah. right. Like strength solves yeah. a lot of problems and just oh understanding gosh, yeah. how to just make people a little bit more robust and resilient, resilient to, yeah. um, to movement and load. I think those, those are, it's huge. Yeah. So, and that like, I just have to say, because I feel like maybe you will know this too, but like early CrossFit was also obsessed with Mark Ripito, who was mm -hmm. like all about like, powerlifting right and like one of his big things was like just being harder to kill and i i wish i wish we would bring a little more of that back into um into the gym because you yeah. know crossfit gyms now like i'm not trying to say like they're ritzy but you know it was it was definitely like it was it was not an environment you wind in very much mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and i i think that was probably in many ways good for people like there's there's room for 
telling me how you feel, but there's also room for like, okay, but also maybe you just need to like work a little harder and maybe you need to just like try to be harder to kill and, Mm -hmm. and everything will work its way out. I wish it wasn't that simple. Like I, sometimes I do sit there and I think like, I wish it was just about me, like, you know, getting someone's glute to fire appropriately. But most of the time it's not, you know, it's as simple as like, that would be really helpful, but this person just needs to be stronger. And yeah. that is helpful in many ways, but also frustrating. Absolutely. I feel you. I feel you. I feel you. I feel you. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So Aaron, we end all these podcasts with a final five questions that give people deeper insight to who you are. They're just rapid fire, fun questions that we ask every guest. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready. Because I feel like I I feel like I just have to cut it because otherwise we'll go on for two hours and oh we definitely will yeah Yeah. Um, (laughs) but if you want to talk about something else we certainly can but anyway this is great let's do this final five questions and I'm interested to see what you what you say how you answer what would be your walkout song oh no this is so this is too much oh my gosh. All right, I'm just going to go with literally anything by Rick Ross. <laughs> you know what? I respect that. That's great. That is that's so just great. me being honest. I could have said a lot of other things, but that's just me being honest. <laughs> I love it. Uh, what's your favorite exercise? Uh, Turkish get up. I mean, I love snatching. Like the beauty of it is really fun for me, but mm-hmm. Turkish get ups like never cease to be interesting to me, fun, a little dramatic, which I definitely am. Mm-hmm. Um, beautiful in some way and also functional like very very useful for many many problems do you use them clinically um you know what i haven't in a while i probably uh i think i gave somebody a turkish get up set up once like so far but yeah i definitely would yeah i definitely find them very helpful if you had to have one food for the rest of your life what would it be is that like a single thing or is, can it be like a meal? It can be a meal. Okay. I'm going to break this to the world. Um, Korean food is essentially the same meal over and over and over again. And so if I had to eat one meal for the rest of my life, it would be Korean food. Just Korean, Korean meal. It's literally meat, a bunch of panchan. That's it. Okay. <laughs> what, what's your guilty pleasure? Uh, what's my guilty pleasure? It has to be something guilty. Uh, cause my mind went to music because mm-hmm. I could just like sit down and do that for a long time. But, um, wow, this is a really hard one. I mean, more, I don't, it's not guilty. I don't know. More I respect recently, the sitting down and listening to music that, that works. Well, it's not listening. It's playing, which is, which what, sounds what you... like, again, I'm tooting my own horn, but, um, I interrupted you though. I feel like my current guilty pleasure, to be honest, is that, um, so I've recently started biking in the city again Mm -hmm. and, um, I definitely sometimes just bike back and forth on, on the, um, bike lanes. Like, so if it's just like a really nice day or Mm -hmm. if I've like had like a really rough day at the clinic, like I'll just literally like spruce fine, spruce fine, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. Which isn't super guilty, but it is kind of silly. And I like yeah, it. But I respect that. I, I like a good walk. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I sometimes I walk, but yeah. mostly riding lately. Okay. Um, and then what's your favorite thing about Philly? <laughs> I can't say the bike lanes. Um, so <laughs> my favorite thing about Philly. Oh, I, I love Philly. Um, I mean, maybe it's a little cliche. Oh, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a little story and it'll be brief, but basically I had brunch with, um, I had brunch with two of my friends from the gym, Morgan and Shana. Um, and we were like sitting outside of Bud and Maryland's and basically while we were sitting there having our like nice normal coffee conversation, this dude came up and tried to chuck a chair at us. Um, and yeah, that sounds like not a story about something that is my favorite thing in Philly, but here's what happened. Uh, Morgan and Shana and I were just like, we got this. And we basically just like talked him down and he just like walked away. And then he came back and tried to like give us money to say, sorry. Um, 
And I was like, dude, no, you're having a bad day. Like, don't sweat it. Not a big deal. And then afterwards, Mm -hmm. Shana and Morgan were like, wow, like only in Philly. And it's so weird that we're all just like mostly fine with that. (laughs) Yeah, but you guys are all like strong, independent, like women. Yeah, I guess so. But like, apparently this guy, he picked the wrong table. I don't know. Or the right table. Because we were like, I don't know. Like we weren't undisturbed, but for the most part, we were like, oh, this is nothing we haven't seen before. <laughs> and oh my goodness. so I don't know. I feel like all, because I was going to say, like, I like that Philly is a little bit gritty, right? Like I like that mm-hmm. um, it's a neighborhood, um, all that other fun stuff. But really it's just this aspect of like, if you live here, like everyone else is terrified and you're just sort of like, yes, it's not perfect, but you learn to be smart. You learn to like mm-hmm. take the good with the bad. And I don't know. There's just something special about Philly. It's 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 great. It's a special place. <laughs> is that an answer awesome. to your question? I hope so. Well, Philly is lucky to have you, Aaron. We're glad that you're you're still in the Philly area, and we appreciate everything you've done for fitness in in Philadelphia. And every I'm right excited to you. see. Well, thank you. And I'm excited to see kind of what the next step in your career is because you're thinking about all the, the right things, the amazing things, and you're going to bring it together and you're going to create something extraordinary. So I'm glad that you came on and I'm glad that we're friends. Oh, thanks, John. Same, Absolutely. same. Thank you for having me. If you, if people want to get in contact with you, um, do you want to share any um, social media, anything like that? Sure. I have a very um, poorly maintained website, which is www.aaron. Uh, leafarmer.com um, <laughs> and my um, Instagram handle is also at Aaron Lee Farmer and the Lee is L-E-E um, but yeah I think that's it for now that's all the places and ways to find me if you are interested in finding me great we appreciate you Aaron and um, thank you for coming on thanks thank you John bye